All right, hey, everyone on, uh, Liana, er, have you accepted everybody into the room? Everyone is in. Awesome. Well, hey everyone, my name is Wesley Donahue, and I work for Senator Sandy Sin, who you should see here on the screen, along with a couple other people. One's my assistant, uh, Liana, who is just helping us with the tech side of this today. And uh, Todd Timmons is calling in. He's an attorney from the South Carolina Department of Employment and Workforce. So let me just tell you how this is going to happen today. Uh, a lot of people sent in questions. We have compiled all those questions. A lot of the same question uh, over and over, to be honest with you. So Senator Sin is going to read off those questions, and um, she and Todd are going to give you the answers as best as they can. If they don't answer your question fully, just there's a button on your screen that says raise hand. Just raise your hand. And then Leon is going to let you in. The only reason you're seeing four people instead of everybody right now is because we literally had a hundred people um, request to come in this, and we just thought it'd be too confusing to have everybody on the screen. But when you raise your hand, you're going to have the ability to then jump in and have uh, that follow-up question asked. If you did not get to uh, send in a question, just use the chat functionality. And if we have extra time here at the end, we'll try to get to your question. Um, Senator, I think that's about it, right? Sure. Okay. Well, I'll jump in and then I'll hand it on over to Todd. Uh, the reason we're having this is day in, day out, really, for the last six weeks, seven weeks. This is pretty much what my office and I have been doing is just answering these unemployment questions one by one, bit by bit. This particular Zoom is meant mainly, it can be for, for employers, but definitely for employees. We've had other Zooms that are dealing with the triple P loan, which is totally different. Um, there, People are confused in the different types of gun help, but this is specifically dealing with the unemployment issues. So but I've got a list of what I know are the common questions. Um, I probably have a list too, but folks, if we're not able to get to you, uh, then you can simply just uh, write us a question or write me a question later. If you live in District 41, I will work really hard to get an answer, but a lot of times I'll know these kind of things off the top of our head. We also have a, uh, a very easy do publication that answers a lot of these questions too, with just some quick links. So maybe we'll be able to help you. But if for some reason we don't, we're not able to get to your question today in this hour, we are gonna give the list of the questions over to Todd and then be able to get back to you. A lot of you did not submit your uh, claim numbers or your addresses, physical addresses. So in order for us to get with you after this seminar, we're gonna need your claim numbers and physical addresses. Uh, Todd, do you want to just jump in and give some quick pointers or do you want me to get some common questions? Yeah, Senator, I can, I can say a few words just to kind of kind of set the table for us. But um, so uh, just so everyone knows, we are um, we have paid out already more than three hundred fifty one million dollars in, in state and federal benefits. So I wanted to leave with that to let you guys know. I know it's frustrating trying to reach us, uh, but we are we are trying to get these benefits out the door as quickly as possible. And we understand what everyone's going through. We understand people are hurting, whether we've got we've got claimants on the line or we've got employers on the line, or maybe we even got some self-employed folks on the line. Uh, we understand that right now this is, this is a stressful time. And so what we're trying to do is to come alongside you and answer your questions and get you some help um, so that we can make this process a little bit easier. Our call center, it, I know that there might be some questions about the call center. We have increased our staffing capacity there by 856%. So we have added a lot of people to that call center. I do think that the that the demand of the state to to call in is probably always going to outpace what we're able to do. But I do want y'all to know it's not like we're you were sitting here and we don't understand that people are trying to reach us. Uh, we are doing what we can to get people on that line and trained, um, and hopefully we'll have some more some more um, information on the call center here pretty soon. Um, the other big thing, um, as the senator mentioned is we've got we've got a new program for the self-employed that's rolling out and that's going to cover folks who are self-employed uh, who work who get paid on a 1099 gig worker so our uber drivers um, folks that um, might work in similar app-based businesses um, and so normally you would not be eligible for unemployment you, the way unemployment works is employers pay into the system we collect all that money in a big trust fund, and when somebody gets laid off through no fault of their own, we pay out benefits. Well, if you're in one of those, those buckets that I just mentioned, there's nobody to pay taxes on you. 
So we don't have a pool of money to pay your benefits. But the federal government stepped in and said, okay, these people, they didn't, they didn't cause the pandemic. They didn't, they didn't cause business to be shut down. So we need to have benefits available for them as well. And those benefits started paying out on Friday. So hopefully some of the folks in this call may have already, may have already been paid or may have already gotten their claim through. And that's good. That's what we want to hear. Um, but just so you know that we've got kind of got both those programs up and running the regular UI with the additional $600 in federal money. And then we've also got this new program called Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, which is PUA. And that is for the folks who normally would not be eligible for UI. Um, so I guess that's a little bit of an introduction. Um, do you want to you want to go into questions or is there anything else would you like me yeah. to touch on? Yeah, we have we have I can already tell you just looking at this seven pages of question and questions in very small type. So we're not gonna be able to get all of these, but hopefully we'll get to them all eventually. Uh, one of the big ones is my social security number comes back as invalid, but it's not. How do I fix? Um, I can tell you, Todd, I did get advice from one constituent who said that he just uploaded a copy of his social security card and that fixed the problem for him. But what do you tell people that are saying, look, I, you know, I keep getting rejected because of my social security number. Right, so we we have done some system edits to make sure that that process is as easy as possible. So we had to, it basically involves checking people's social security numbers to make sure it matches what the feds have on these people. Uh, because what we don't wanna do is have any kind of an identity theft situation or have some bad actors trying to take advantage of people. Um, so we think that we've worked with our federal partners and gotten that for the most part straightened out. We certainly have heard a lot less um, in terms of complaints on that particular issue. But here's a couple tricks I'll tell you. If you, if you don't have a middle name put in there, um, you can, adding a middle name or a middle initial, whatever is appearing on your social security card has, has helped people get through. So what you would do is you would add that middle initial or add the middle name, try it e each way. And then on the drop down menu, you just, you just select, I, I misspelled my name. Um, and then you could do it vice versa. If you have a middle name in there and it's not going through, pull the middle name out, select that I misspelled my name option and see if that'll get you through. Um, if not, I, you, it would be uploading your social security card so we can verify, okay, it's, it's something that's getting cross matched with social security administration. But a lot of people have had success with, with the middle initial middle name field. Okay. That's a Point. application and hit quit but it won't let me go back and correct how can I go back and fix my errors um that one that one is going to be specific on the person's claim so that uh, I'm not sure gonna I have could to be able to answer that one with for this what's her um, okay, okay then we yeah. often get um, I've started getting them out from the date I was laid off how to go back and capture the money from the first weeks I was laid off so that what that sounds like to me is that the person may have have not certified for their past weeks we need to continue to and I'm not sure that they're going to have an option in the system or perhaps that person can send their specific information into you and we can get back with them. That's not, that's again, it's not going to be something, I don't think that, I don't think the link's going to open up in the system for them. It, it isn't. That, that's the issue. They can't find the, the, the link in the system. So, okay, with, with people yeah. like that, then we'll get the exact information, claim them, we'll get it over to you. Um, Okay, we have I mean, some of these questions now that are specific to the individual um, from Karen Hemingway. She says, my son just graduated from college and is now ready to enter the workforce, but cannot due to COVID. Is he eligible for any of the benefits? And if so, what do I put down as his employer? Right. Is, so for a lot of those folks that are in this situation, they already have, they had a job offer beforehand. Um, but if they don't have, in, in that case, you would you could input that information if COVID prevented you from starting a job. Um, but if you, if you're trying to enter the workforce, what the, the process is the same. You would apply. You may be denied though, because you didn't, you wouldn't qualify for state unemployment. 
because you don't have wages in our system. But fortunately, we've got that new federal program, PUA, which covers people with limited wage history. So I'm guessing this individual would fall in. Uh-oh, I lost you. Tell us again. Wes, can you hear us? I can hear you, and I am texting Todd right now to let him know we lost him. He was on his cell phone, so maybe he's maybe he's driving through something. I'm texting him okay. right now. Okay, well, so for everybody listening, the fix that he just mentioned is probably a fix for just about anybody. I know that a lot of people have said, look, um, my employer is really the same employer, but they've changed their company names. And I'm being told I'm not eligible because I haven't worked there long enough, but I've worked there for many, many years. So it sounds to me like you could probably use the same trick that he was just saying, you could still qualify for that PUA. Um, but then you're probably also entitled to the state portion of it. So again, you're, you might have to identify your specific claim number. And Senator Sin, I'm back online. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yes. Thanks. Okay. And so yeah, he, he, that person with the with the insufficient wage history should be um, should be eligible under the under the PUA. And I just wanted to, you know, just the thing to expect is you'll get denied eventually, and you'll have another link. It for having you know multiple 1099s and things of that nature right so so if they have multiple jobs if they're if they're paid on 1099 if they if, like if they let's say they have multiple jobs where they're paid by 1099 they normally would not be eligible because they're 1099 employees but that information you know whatever their earnings are from the combined 1099 job would factor into this federal program so um that's kind of how that would work. If it's multiple earnings from a W-2 employers, it's kind of the same calculus, but they're just going to be eligible for the state program. So we'll, we'll take earnings, for whatever you have in your, the, the term we use is base period, but it's a look back period. Um, but yeah, you would enter both those informations and those would go into the calculation of, of what your state weekly benefit amount would be. In the 600, just the 600. So do they even need to put in a whole bunch of different, um, you know, 1099s or whatever, it seems to me like if you put in one, you're going to get the 600 and that's all you'd be entitled to anyway, right? Uh, no, ma'am, not, not exactly. So the federal program is, it's, we want to make sure we've got, it's a little confusing, but the, the, the $600 is one federal program. The eligibility for PUA is a separate program. So let's take our, the example of the Uber driver, the person would get the $600 from that one federal program and then they would get their equivalent amount in state unemployment, but it's paid with federal dollars. So you're actually getting up to 926, um, even if you're in that federal program. So what what a what a 1099 earner or, or an Uber driver would see is they would get the $600 from the one federal program, and then they would also get the equivalent amount of state unemployment. So that's why we need your earnings. Mm -hmm. And um, right away when you file under that the new PUA program, you'll get the minimum amount, and then you'll have 21 days to show us what you actually earned. And so once you submit that documentation within the 21 days, if you show us, hey, I need more than the minimum amount because I've earned more, then from that point forward, we'll start paying you um, the higher amount plus your 600 bucks. Is that, I got am I, have I totally confused it? No, I, I understand, I appreciate that. And then what about the folks that keep saying they're having to change their applications multiple times? Um, since this new program rolled out on, what was it, Saturday for the gig workers and 1099 employees, uh, do, do the folks who already previously applied need to go back in and jump some more hoops as far as the new application? Yes, but it should be very, very uh, simple. So everyone who has already applied in our system and was found ineligible because they, they didn't qualify for a regular state UI should have gotten a link emailed to them. Um, but even if you didn't get the email, you can, if you log back into your account, you'll see it. It says apply for pan, uh, pandemic unemployment assistance. If you click on that link, you'll go through a series of questions um, that ask you 
and they're specific to self-employed folks. So you, it's not going to be the same register, password, and a whole bunch of questions. It's much simpler, but they do need to go back in there if they were found ineligible under the state program and see if they're eligible for this new federal program. Okay, great. Um, so I have a question from Teresa Jackson, and this is a pretty common one too. I keep being told I have to do job searches, but obviously I can't go on job searches. So can you give us a workaround on that? Yes. So um, first of all, we've revised some of those questions. So I hope that the questions are easier to read now. Um, but no, you do not need to do a job search. Um, so I, I think probably where she's getting hung up is there's a question that said you must actively search for work. And it was a big long thing. And it said, um, will you accept this requirement? Yes or no. Um, and so that was tripping some people up. We're, we're going to be removing that. We've got to get it processed through our system, but it should be out of there pretty soon. Um, so the folks, oh, go ahead. Yeah, well, because I had a number of people ask me that same question, and they wanted to be honest on the forms, which oh, I, yeah. and then it was sad for me to have to say, you know, I, I want you to be honest, too, um, and I understand you've got a, a very susceptible family member. The physician says that you cannot go back to work because you've got a COVID-related problem within your household, and therefore you cannot go back to work, um, yet if she were to answer it honestly, then she would not get the benefits, she'd be denied. So what was your recommendation there? Right, so um, like I said, hopefully we fix this confusion. The way you answer the question will not disqualify you from benefits because we have the requirement to look for work, we've, we've turned off for this pandemic situation. So I think this people are having trouble with this is because they're reading the question and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, they told me up front that I was gonna be guilty of fraud if I answer it wrong. And they get to this question that they don't want to click forward because they don't want to get in trouble, right? Most of us want to do the right thing. Um, but you can go ahead and click through. That answer is not going to disqualify you because we've turned it off. It's just that the way the question is worded um, might cause some people to pause. So um, the number one thing to remember is that question is not going to disqualify you. But um, the number two thing is I think we fixed that going forward. Um, we rephrased the questions to say, like, for example, are you available for work is what it used to say. Now it says, are you available for work or would you be available if you were recalled from your employer? Because that's what most people are out of work for. So we hope we've clarified those questions. Um, yeah, if, but what if about the ones that are not? They, they can't go back because of um, health concerns. You know, there's an, I know there's an ex a federal exemption for that um, if they're particularly susceptible to COVID. Uh, but yeah. for them to answer that question honestly, even if they're recalled, they can't go back because they're gonna have a physician uh, saying that they should not. So what do they do? Yes, ma'am, that's a good question. So what, what's gonna happen with those folks is the, the, the federal po program that opened up unemployment for the gig workers and the self-employed folks, it also opened up unemployment for people who typically would be ineligible because they're not available to work. You know, that's normally a restriction. We don't pay people, um, unemployment benefits if they're not available to work. Well, this, this program has opened that up for people who can't work because of, as a direct result of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. um, so they, what will happen for them is they will be, a, be receiving disqualifications because they're not eligible for state UI, but they're gonna get that same link that I just mentioned that says apply for pa pandemic unemployment assistance. And if they click in there and certify that they were unavailable as a direct result of COVID-19, then they'll be eligible for benefits. Right, okay. Um, I now have a question from Gresh Meggett, who's a seasonal uh, worker. He basically um, does charter captain situations. And, and of course, in November and December, January even, you don't have much income from that. Uh, and he was working you know, as an Uber driver and different other things at, at, at the time. But there's a section when he went to fill it out, it said, you know, what's the last day you worked? And he honestly wanted to answer it, well, it's back in November because, but he's seasonal. So it doesn't really explain that he's really now messed up due to COVID because he can't uh, do his job. So how is somebody like him able, does, does he fill out a whole new application uh, and then just put a February date or does he, have to go back into that original application? Is there some way for him to explain it? Okay, um, Senator, and I actually, uh, while we were on the line, I got our UI operations manager down here to so make sure we can answer all your questions. So um, his name is Brent Phillips, and I think Brent is gonna take this question for you. Okay. Hey, so yeah, if he did have additional work uh, in the original claim that he did file, if there's other work past the seasonal, 
he would need to go in and just go ahead and complete another application and show us that other work. Uh, I think you said he was an Uber driver maybe or had a few hours doing something along those lines. Yeah, and, he really yeah. doesn't work so much except for starting right about the time that this whole problem started, which is when sure. the weather started getting nice. Sure, so. and if he could reflect that on the application, and then we'll go ahead and have that application, we can review it and then pass along the necessary steps after that. But that would be the first step, is just to go ahead and file the new claim mm -hmm. with that updated employment information. Okay, all right, that sounds good. Um, this is another common one I get. I worked in another state and moved here shortly before COVID, COVID and then was laid off. Now it's saying I'm not qualified because I didn't work here that long. In fact, I know I had another one. It was from a, uh, uh, I believe he was, works in Atlanta because he is a, let's see, Paul Thomas is his name. His employer is an airline in Atlanta, but he lives in South Carolina. He is taking a 50% pay cut. Does he apply in Georgia or South Carolina? So he would apply wherever he last worked. And if he worked here and he's showing that it's ineligible, it may just be that, not to go too deep here, but that's a combined wage claim where we would combine the wages from multiple states in order for someone to get eligibility. So it could be that even though his initial letter showed that he was ineligible, we're really just waiting for wages from other states to come in to, the, to his monetary benefits to see if he's eligible for a claim. So. You would file, if he last worked here in South Carolina, he would file the South Carolina claim and make sure that you know he showed us that he had other employment. And we would request those wages from another state, which would then, um, we would try to make sure he's monetarily eligible for unemployment insurance benefits. So as long as he showed us on the claim that he did work somewhere else in another state, there's mm -hmm. no additional action necessary on, on the claimant's end. We request those wages. And when we get those back, we add them to the claim to determine eligibility. Okay. So he, if he lives here, he can go ahead and apply here, but then y'all are going to have to verify in Atlanta or whatever the other state is um, for him to get the full eligibility. Is that right? Yep. It's a pretty simple process. Nothing from the, the claimant side they would need to do, but yeah, just go ahead and file the claim here and mm -hmm. uh, we'll process it and see what steps are necessary. Okay. Well, so um, I've had, like I said, similar, similar questions on that one. Um, and one of them also is if I just take a pay cut, do I, do I still qualify? Am I going to get some benefit? My employer didn't have to lay me off entirely, but I'm, I'm taking a significant cut in pay. What do I do? So if they, so if they, if they earn more than their weekly benefit amount, then they would not be eligible. So the maximum weekly benefit amount is 326 in South Carolina. And the rough calculation for that is half of your average weekly earnings is, is what your unemployment benefit is. But it gets, it gets, there's a little bit of math involved that I won't go into on this call. But the general idea is if you're, if you're earning more than half of your, um, of your weekly benefit amount, you're not going to be eligible. And you have to work, in order to meet the definition of unemployed, you've got to work less than 30 hours. So those are kind of the two, the two things you have to meet in order to be eligible for unemployment. And that, that just seems not fair to me, to the employee, if he's still having to work, but then not, I mean, I guess working too much, but he's, he's lost half of his salary. That, that seems not fair. So wouldn't they at least be entitled to the federal portion? No, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately not. Um, that's not the way the, the, the law in South Carolina is structured. Um, if they were, if they earn more than that weekly benefit amount, they're not going to be eligible then that, that encourages um, employers not to, to um, I mean, basically just to lay them off totally, wouldn't it? Um, it, it, it might. I mean, normally you don't have this much incentive. It, it, it's a little bit different with the federal government coming in on top and adding 600 bucks to everyone's weekly benefit amount, which is money people need, but it also kind of, kind of creates these weird scenarios that you're touching on. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that they could consider doing, you know, folks that you're talking to, talking with ma'am is they could say you know we'll do an a and a b shift and the a shift works one week and the b shift works the next week and then if you don't have any wages in your week um you can get a, you can get unemployment for that week and, and then the week you work you get you get your wages and you can kind of do it that way okay. uh, as opposed to, as opposed to just reducing hours and then nobody gets unemployment so i mean some 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 businesses can do that some can't but that's kind of the best guidance i can give you 
Okay. Um, from Sharon Barnett, she asks, uh, she draws a state retirement, but she still works. Is she able to qualify? Potentially. Uh, if someone is receiving a pension and they're working, that pension may be reportable. Uh, there's a couple of different factors in place when someone files that claim. And the easiest thing that I, I think we can always tell people is if their hours have been reduced or they're, no, they're not working, is to file a claim. And when they file that claim, is a, there's a piece in there that does ask about if they're receiving a pension. Mm -hmm. And we, we'd get that information, we'd review it, and we would contact that claimant if we needed additional questions or we, if we needed some follow-up information. Okay. Um, I have a lady, I guess it's a lady, Ladretta Harris. Why are some people within the same employer getting paid immediately and others taking eight weeks? Yeah, we probably need to follow up with her individually. Um, eight weeks seems extremely long. Uh, so we, that would definitely be something we would really like to look at. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I do tell people, though, is everybody's claim is a little different. Um, there could be different scenarios that go into it from where maybe they work before this employer, how much earnings they make. And I think, you know, we do get, it gets kind of tricky when you compare yourself to your neighbor because mm -hmm. it's so particular to you and what your situation may be with your claim from the way that you potentially answered a question to the way they didn't answer a question. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's a little tricky when you start comparing to each other, but maybe if there's a way that you could route that information to us, we'll definitely take a look at that individual and see what's going on with that claim. Okay, well, so a lot of people have told me that their employers either didn't help them with the paperwork or they have waited long enough that the employer should have verified. What do y'all do if you don't have an employer verify and the claimant is still waiting? So if someone files a lack of work claim, we do ask the employer to verify. And, and one reason that I think that's very important is what we find during major claim events like this whether it's during a disaster or sometimes like this is previous employees will try to come back in and file and tell us they were laid off so it's very important when that message goes out so we do need to contact that employer and verify that employee was actually working and was actually laid off however if we don't receive the information back from the employer mm -hmm. we, we we don't delay the benefits okay. we go ahead and, and remove the issue off the claim. So even if the employer chooses not to respond and we don't get the information back in the time required, we go ahead and remove that issue so the person can get paid and not hold up their benefits. Okay. All right. So um, this, this is from Nicholas Robel. Robel. Um, he didn't receive his unemployment check for this past week. It's been over a week and he has been certifying his benefits every week as well as completing the two required job searches. I thought they didn't have to do the job searches right now, right? They don't. That's, that's correct. The, the job searches aren't required. It's still available and, people, and you can still do them. Um, you know, like we talked about in the past, there are some employers out there actively looking to hire individuals. So, uh -huh. But no, it's not a requirement on the unemployment for right now. But if he's done all this stuff as far as certifying his benefits for the next week, is this just going to be a problem personal to him? Yes. And it, it could just be as simple. Maybe he had earnings and he worked a few hours and, and, and it may have been more than his week of benefit amount. He may have mistakenly answered a question wrong. I'm, it, it would be very specific to him as why he haven't, hasn't received payment yet. Okay. So, um, Nicholas, if you're listening, that's why I'm going to have to get your claim number and your address. Uh, from Johnny Austria, when I was trying to register, I was told I had worked in another state and they cannot go any further with the, um, with the online application. So what do you, what do we do about that? Um, I'm just trying to think that through. I'm not sure why he wouldn't be able to go any further on the online. I'm not, you know, there's different steps from registering that account to actually filing through the unemployment process. Um, and Brent, if, if he if he answered that question in error, usually you can get that. If, if they ask you on a prior screen if you've had out of state wages, some people I've heard have mistakenly answered that yes. So I think he should be able. He might want to try to go back and change that answer for, on the out of state wages question from if he generally hasn't worked out of state. I don't know if he has or not. He might want to change that answer to no, and then see if he can get through. I've had that come through a couple times. Okay. All right, let's see, from Jen Savko. Uh, she's worked for Dorchester 
to, and they pay like they normally pay teachers. Um, I'm sorry, this one's too long. I'll have to um, I'll have to get get back to you on this one. It's it's pretty detailed. Uh, from Teresa Jackson, she was laid off from J.C. Penney in March due to COVID. Applied for unemployment and have not received it yet. Also, the website on the claimant page says that she still has to complete SC works, but how am I to do that due to COVID-19? Yep. Yeah. so part of the claims filing process is that you complete a job registration through the SC Works website. And even though we are, we're not having the requirement to look for work, um, we still, you know, that is part of the initial process. But I will say, even though she sees that message, that is not delaying payment, the delaying benefits. It is an action that is required, but it's not going to stop her payments or benefits. Um, okay. As far as maybe why she hasn't received payment, I'm not sure if she's monetarily ineligible. Um, I believe Todd was speaking on that when I walked in, that if someone is doesn't have enough earnings potentially to establish a claim, I think Todd spoke about the additional benefits that are available now that they can apply for. So I'm not sure what maybe is going on with her individual scenario, but the message that she's seeing, she can just disregard. Okay, and there are a number of you who asked about the weekly job searches. So those of you who asked that one, you don't have to do that anymore, I think is what he's saying. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, some of these are the same, I've taken a pay cut Will it still qualify? I think we've already answered these for several other people. Um, oh gosh, when it starts, my situation is complicated and you know I'm not gonna <laughs> that. Um, let's see, let's see, Betty Gales. My primary full-time job is in real estate. I'm 72 years old and sheltering in place. I can't make sales or take listings or anything. Um, so she applied for unemployment and she also has a second job where she coaches real estate people. Um, can she still qualify even if she's going to partially coach people, but she's not able to actually go out and sell real estate due to her age. Right. The, I think the question will, will be how much she earns from that, that coaching job. If, if it's more than what her weekly benefit amount would be, um, when we take into account what she was earning as a real estate agent, then she would not be eligible. But if it's, if it's less then she could, um, she could certify that she's had an income loss based on that real estate earnings that she might be eligible. See, and this, that's the kind of thing that worries me because this encourages people to not work. Uh, when we, when, you know, it would, it would encourage her to not continue coaching people and make money if that pushes her over the monetary limit. But I guess that's how the system is. Um, let's see. Of course, I got a lot of people complaining about the, the phone, the phone situation. They keep saying they get cut off. Um, I don't know if there's a way to, to fix that and maybe get the person's name and number that they were talking to, but they say they hold on for hours and hours only to be cut off after finally getting somebody. Yeah. And I, I know that we have heard that from a number of people and we do, we have staff that, or we have a, someone looking at the IVR continuously. Um, mm -hmm and finding different ways to make sure that there's no disconnect, no issues with why that call may disconnect or may drop. Uh, we have heard that from a number of people. So yeah, that IVR and the phone system is being looked at continuously to find it, to make it simpler for people to use. And right. when you get to the person not getting dropped off as well. Okay. Um, all right. So Mr. Lewis Allen Danielson, I think we already answered your question about the middle name thing, but if not, you can follow up with us after this. Uh, let's see, Edith Taroli. Um, she opened a claim four weeks ago. It says she's ineligible, which is insane. <laughs> she's worked for the same employer for 25 years and she's uploaded the W-2s and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I have the feeling because she works for an, an optometrist, I believe it is. She's been working there for a long time. I have the feeling hers is going to be because she makes too much money. Um, but Ms. Taroli, if that's not it, then let us know. Gentlemen, could you tell us one more time what that dollar figure is that if she makes above that, that would make her ineligible? 
Right. It would be, it would be half of your weekly benefit or it would be your weekly benefit amount, which, which is basically half of your average weekly earnings. So if you ballpark what you make in a week for some of us that get paid on a W2 and same salary every week, it's easy to do, but I know for some people it might be a little more complicated, but that's kind of how you ballpark it. And that number is capped at 326. So even if you do that math and you come out over 326, 326 is the number you want to look at. Um, and that, if she's working part time, um, if she's working more than 30 hours or more, that would be one reason. And then the other reason would be if she earns more than that weekly benefit amount. Okay. Uh, let's see. Hey, Senators Wesley. I yes. have, I have had numerous people in the chat room ask about that 326 number. Just to clarify, is that for an individual or for a couple? That, that's going to be for an individual, um, and it's a low, low amount, but that's what the state, that's what the state that it is. and Todd or, or Brent, one of y'all tell us what the issues were, because some people won't qualify for the state benefit, and then you can't even process them for the 600. That That's the bigger issue, I think. Yeah, it sounded like the phone kind of dropped for a second there, so I'm going to try to answer what, what I think we heard is, yes, the 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 maximum is 326 in South Carolina. And in order to be eligible for the $600 additional payment, you must receive at least $1 state UI benefits. So even though you must receive at least something in state benefits to qualify for the $600 in additional benefits. And that's I apologize if that wasn't the question. Uh, I think that is the question. That's why everybody's confused because if you don't even earn a dollar, then you can't get the 600, which is going to encourage people to not work. And that's, I got a problem with that just philosophically, but there's no way around that. They can't get the 600 if they don't qualify for at least a dollar. And even though they're taking a big pay cut in a lot of instances, is that what you're saying? Correct. They have to qualify for state benefits to receive the additional 600. All right. Well, um, let's see. And, and Wes, if you want to um, grab any of these questions, some of these are just so detailed that I'm going to have to break it down for them. And, um, but if you have any that you see coming in on the chat line, jump in and I'll try to um, make some of these questions that people have given me order. And for, for those folks with the more detailed questions that you'll be sending in, uh, the, the, the language on our stuff is claim it ID. So that's the number you want to give us. And um, that's just kind of the do language. If you, if you give us the claim it ID, um, that's what you want to send along so that when they get forwarded to us, we can find you real quick. Okay. So, and let's talk about how long this can last. If you don't mind, I've got a lady here, Stephanie Mishu. I think that's what she's talking about is uh, she's anticipating that they're going to be like Lyft drivers or there are a lot of other businesses that when they finally get going, it's going to be slower. Um, so how long will they be able to continue to get some of the relief? Wasn't it through July 31st? Yes, ma'am. So the through July 31st is that's the increase in the $600. That's when that program expires. Uh, it may or may not be extended by the feds. It's, that's kind of beyond our, our control. But the, the, the PUA program goes until the end of December. So whereas the $600 will go away, you would still be eligible for whatever that other portion is uh, based on your actual um, earnings. So th there will be unemployment available for gig workers through the end of 2020. It's just not going to be as, the benefits won't be as much as they would be after July 31st. And they do still have to co come in each week and say, okay, this is what I made. So that way, you know, the numbers may adjust a little bit, um, but still those who are severely impacted because the business is slower, um, they could still get paid, right? Exactly right. Okay. Wes, you got anything? I see you up there. Yes, yeah, Senator, I was going to say, we got a lot of people raising their hands. Um, would you like to spend the last 10 to 15 minutes letting people into the, the room and asking their questions directly? Sure, that doesn't, that doesn't bother me at all. And like I said, y'all, my email address is sennn at sccenate.gov. Sandy with the Y, S-E-N-N at sccenate.gov. So after we're over and you, you didn't get your question answered full, please just email me, give me your specific issue, claim number, 
and we will try to get you an answer at least by email. But sure, Wes, go ahead and open it up. Okay, so if you have a question that hasn't been answered yet, uh, you, there's a raise your hand button on the screen. Just raise your hand and then Liana is gonna let you in one by one to chat directly with uh, Senator Sin and Todd. Okay, so uh, the first question we have comes from Jen Savko. Jen, you are now allowed to speak. Um, make sure you unmute yourself before you start speaking. Hey there, yeah, I, um, thanks for having this. I, I, I'm a substitute teacher in Dor Dorchester District 2, and of course I'm missing out on, on you know, some jobs. I had a long-term sub position scheduled and missing out. Um, I initially applied um, and was found ineligible, um, but then I was sent an email um, on Friday to reapply, but it didn't give me an option of anything other to reapply for except for more unemployment, the UI again. So I did that and this morning I was, it, it shows that I am, it's open and I guess I'm eligible because it gives an amount there. Um, so I guess that's the case, but how do, how do you know that you're qualified? Oh, are the payments gonna be retroactive to the first time I applied? Or they just start with this and am I also gonna be eligible for the 600? So we'll just speak a little bit uh, in regards to that. So if you filed an initial claim and you were found ineligible for benefits, meaning that you didn't have enough money in your base period to establish a claim. So then we, we notified you that you could have benefits available to you under the pandemic unemployment assistance program, which you com sounds like you completed, which is what it sounds like. Cause now there's something showing in your amount. If that's the case, and you are eligible for the PUA program and not the state benefits, those mm -hmm. benefits would go back to when you initially um, were laid off okay. and started the process. Uh, but the only thing I, I would like to say is we discuss it is I'm just going based off of general information and, and some right. things specific to your claim could be a little different or a little bit off. So I just want to make sure it's not a, a blanket answer that, that right. covers everyone because your right. situation could be different. But based on what you said, it sounded like that you do have PUA um, benefits available to you. And the way you would know if you qualified, um, as soon as you filed that claim and those wages did show up on your claim, mm -hmm. you would receive another determination sent to you, mailed to you, showing what those benefits would be. Okay. And that it doesn't, it's, it's not called PUA in there though. It just says another claim for UI. So it's showing yeah. two claims, um, one I'm ineligible for UI, and the other claim is, I guess, eligible because it says it's open and it gives me some monetary, you know, determinations. Yeah, um, just without being able to look specifically into your claim, uh, I, I don't know if I could give you the best answer. Okay. Um, uh, other than it does sound like maybe you do have some eligibility, which is a good thing, uh, just yes. depending on what program and how far back it goes. Uh, we may need to try to find a way to help determine that for you. Okay, I did. I did send in my claimant ID and my email address and my um, a mailing address as well. So maybe it could be addressed at a later point. Okay, sure. Bye. Okay, thank you. So I'm seeing several people asking for my email address again. I'm not. I can't read everything. I'm just up on the panelist screen, but I have seen several pop up. It's uh, Sandy with a Y, Sen, S E N N, at sccenate.gov. Ready for our next question, Senator? Yes. Okay, this is coming from Cindy McFadden. Cindy, make sure you unmute yourself. Hi. Um, I was told by um, someone to go ahead and apply for the unemployment benefits even though I was self-employed because you had to be denied first and that y'all weren't even ready for the PUA yet so uh, I got the email Friday night went ahead Saturday morning early applied for it they asked me for for my um, tax return I uploaded it it said in red letters that it was successfully uploaded however it does not show up in my documents is there a reason for that let me let me ask you this just and once again, without being able to look and see, I'm, I'm just, just talking to you in general. But does it show you an amount that you're potentially eligible for now? No. Okay. And you, and you said you did this Saturday? 
Saturday, six o'clock Saturday morning. Yes, sir. Okay. So, you know, I think your point was very valid. This program was put in place um, into Friday just to start with, and then individuals have filed on Saturday. So I wouldn't think there's anything necessary as long as you've uploaded it, there's nothing additional needed on your part this time. Um, Even though it doesn't show up under my documents? No, as long as you, your upload was successful, we'll receive it here. It comes into us. Um, if you well, like, if you, if you like, and, and like I said, so, so I can't verify it over this call, there's another spot that you could. Um, there's a, another email address if you wanted just to route it to there too, just as a, just if it, you know, just as a precaution that you can send that in to us. It's a, it's an Adobe, it's an Adobe PDF file. And I was told by, um, the, the CPA that did my taxes that right. that file is not, um, I mean, I can't even print it out. Gotcha. Yeah. So you couldn't even forward it. I understand. No, but well, the, I will say, too, I will was, say just for, for the whole group to know is we do have dedicated teams assigned to this, to the PUA program. Mm -hmm. And their job is to get these claims handled just as quickly as possible because we know that you guys have been waiting for some time uh, mm -hmm. since you originally filed. So we do have dedicated teams on this project. And if for some reason there's something missing off of, and I, not only yours, but anybody else listening, if there's something missing that we need from you, we will be making sure that we do reach out to you, whether by phone or email, to let you know we need additional information. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I want to give one here real quick. It's from Amy Brabham, and she says that every time she gets finished with the security question, she always gets a message that says an exception has occurred, contact support team, error ID, and it gives her a series of numbers. But then she says she's already been working with Representative Lynn Bennett and even spoken with, um, twice spoken with somebody named Eliza with Do. So is there like a specialized department? I understand that you're putting on a whole lot of new employees, but maybe they, some, some of these are so complicated that they're gonna need to get up to a supervisory level. What do we do about folks like Amy, who it looks like she's been doing an awful lot trying to get through? So it sounds like if she's talked to Eliza, she she has a direct line into our um, our our, t our quality team, who are kind of like you said, who are the who are who's the A team. Mm -hmm. So I, I would recommend following up, you know, following up with Eliza, saying she was on Senator Sin's town hall. That that is probably the quickest way to resolve it is is to go through that. Um, that's what I'd recommend. Okay, Amy, just go ahead and email me afterwards and um, and we'll try to again connect with Eliza and see what what we can do. Um, okay, you got any other questions on your side, Wes? Um, we have another question and this one is coming from Paul Noel Sielski. And Paul, you're now allowed to talk. Make sure you unmute yourself. Paul, you just got to hit the uh, the microphone button. You should be able to speak. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. That was very good on my last name, whoever that was. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, actually, this, this, this question is actually going to answer questions for like 100 bus drivers uh, and myself. Um, I work for DD2, and as a bus driver, we were told last Wednesday to file for unemployment benefits, even though the district is continuing to pay us. I went on and filed my claim after waiting four hours and getting hung up on, and I actually made a mistake on my claim and I was going back to fix it. And I said that I had resigned from my job when I actually had resigned from Berkeley County, my previous job. So basically the, you know, the answer is a flip-flop for the two jobs. So when I went back to, when I went to go try and correct it, an error message came out and it delivered my file to you folks, which made me ineligible. I think that'll correct itself when I, when I start getting paperwork, but I just wanted to let you know about that little glitch and maybe you can tell me how I can correct that because I actually still work for them. But here's the big question that everyone has in DD2. Since they are still paying us, and I'll use me as an example. My base pay every two weeks is $908 because they spread our payout over the 
26 pay periods like they do for teachers. So really when I work 40 or 50 hours a week, I actually make a lot more than 900 bucks, but 908 is my base pay. So when I went into my claim this weekend, I put in one of the boxes that I put that I earned $454 because I just took my base pay and cut it in half. I don't know if that's correct or what we're supposed to do because no one gave us any direction whatsoever. But um, I figure that if I'm, if I put in 454, that's going to eliminate me from eligibility anyway, but I need to know what to tell the drivers. And I also need to know where do they put that information in their claim because all it said, the only boxes that I saw where you can plug where your monetary is, is under severance. And the other one was under vacation. And this is, this is neither one. This is on that list of questions when you file on Sunday that says, were you available to work and all of that stuff. That, that's yep, interesting so. to me because um, if they're still employed at the same level, why would they be entitled to unemployment? Well, because they, I don't know, because they told us, they told us to go ahead and apply, but we're all losing money because they're paying our, our base salary, which is a minimum 30 hours a week. But generally everyone works 40 or more hours a week. So everyone's losing money. Uh -huh. I'm thankful I'm getting my check and I still have my health insurance. Believe me. Yeah. Um, I had three back operations last year, so I'm very thankful. Well, listen, I don't want to cut anybody out of anything that they're, they're entitled, but I, when you said that you were still getting paid, but now I hear what you're saying. It's just, you're not getting paid the same. So, uh, right. Todd, Brent, you got any answers for Paul? And what's the, I guess, what's the cutoff point? Like if a driver every two weeks makes 600, no, let's say they just made 600 bucks. That was a base pay every two weeks. They would probably be eligible for benefits but if their base pay was over six hundred and fifty six dollars which is you know uh, well three twenty six times two six hundred and fifty four dollars fifty two dollars they would not be eligible for any benefits is that accurate hey so there's a lot of pieces here i'll, I'll try to unpack them all and make sure I, I catch every piece and todd jump in if i miss one so well, this, is gonna solve, this is going to solve a, this is going to help you guys a lot because I got 170 people on the phone line calling your store right now. So I'll be able to answer their questions for them. So to go back to the original or original part of the conversation. So anytime someone is receiving or claiming unemployment benefits, they must report all earnings they receive. And it's when you earn them, not necessarily when you receive them. So whenever someone is completing and filing a weekly certification for benefits, any earnings that they've earned that previous week, they need to report them. Okay. And in your particular scenario, and everybody's weekly benefit amount could be a little different, but in your particular scenario, once you're making more than your weekly benefit amount, there really is no unemployment benefits that you would be eligible for. That's even, what though I the, even though the hours have been reduced or, or your pay has been reduced, you're still already over that maximum 326 per week. Right. And for other people, it could be even less if they weren't at the maximum. Right. Um, so that's correct. And so I, that's going to answer, that's going to answer a lot of questions of people. So, yeah, and they will not, think, and they won't be eligible for federal benefits either. And I think that may be where this confusion came from and why you were instructed to apply is you have to look at that. The, the benefits separately is you must qualify for state benefits before right. you're eligible for that federal. And I'm not sure if someone thought that 926, as long as you were earning less than that, you could potentially be eligible for partial, but you have to qualify for the state benefits first. And what about the PUA on the form that, that people are getting? It says if you're eligible for PUA, they will contact you. That's basically just what it means, what it says. Yeah, and, this, and the same thing would apply as long as you're still working or and receiving payments and you're making more than there's, whether it's PUA, state unemployment, any other program, you wouldn't be eligible for because of your earnings. Right. Okay. That, that clears up a lot of stuff for people. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. Yeah. And can you just tell me how I can fix my claim though? That, that one question. Yeah. So whenever well, you... Let's, can you email me? Go ahead and let, if you got a quick answer for him, let's do it. Okay. Thank you. So whenever your employer responds back to that request for us and, and we see the change in employer, 
um, we can add that employer to your account for you. And if you're thinking that you may be over your weekly benefit amount anyway, I don't know if you need to really worry about gotcha. trying to go in and make those changes at this time. Thank you so much. This was a great forum. Thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate that. I've got a quick one here from um, Hans Von Week. He runs Crazy Dutchman Catering and they are until school gets back in they're intentionally not going to reopen until probably august he wants to know if he needs to continue to file on the employer side every week until august or can the employees just file on their side what are the steps he needs to do to ensure that they will continue to re receive benefits until basically school starts which is when he's going to start up again yeah, he'll need to uh, he'll need to keep filing for his employees. It sounds like he's already started that process, so he's going. It'll be smoother and easier if he just does it for. Him. Okay, so could that be a lot of these people's problems? That the ones that keep saying, "Look, I've already clicked um, that I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm entitled or whatever, certified for the next week." Could part of the problem if they didn't get it for one or two of the weeks is because the employer did not likewise certify? No, um, you, probably not. And um, because once that employer uploads and, and files for their staff on a weekly basis, um, there's really nothing left for the claimant to have to worry about on that on that end. So I'm not sure if that particular scenario works. That's why when the employer files for the employees, it, it is a streamlined process, and it's really simpler for everybody, everyone involved. Okay. All right. I don't know how we're doing on time, uh, Wes or Liana, but if you got any more questions from the folks on the line. We uh, we got a couple minutes, Leona. You want to do one more, and then we'll close sure. it out. Sure. Um, okay. So the next question is from. There's no name, but it's the username Galaxy S9. You are now allowed to talk, and if you don't mind telling us your name and unmuting yourself. Um, and can you hear me? We can hear you. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Brittany Hahn. I filed um, literally two days after everybody got shut down on March 20th, and I've had the same pending resolution for general reasons since March 20th. I've, I've been hung up on 100 times, I've called every single morning at 8 o'clock, and been on hold for maximum 10 hours um, last week, and never getting through to anybody, and, and nobody's been able to answer. Like, I haven't received anything at all period and i don't know there's no options for me to appeal there's nothing i can do to resubmit any forms i mean I, I i'm kind of at a loss for i don't even know how to fix it and i can't get a hold of anybody at the unemployment office to actually help me or look at my claim hey well first off i apologize for you know the, the things that you've gone through and we'll do our best to try to get some resolution for you I don't know if it's possible for, the, for that contact information to find its way to us, but we'll definitely do all we can to look into that situation Did and you see know, what's going on with your I claim. I emailed Candy, my claimant number and stuff, so she um, should have that email in her, um, so I'm not really sure. I mean, when I, will they correspond with me like on the website page, like the, D, the unemployment page, or email me on my, or call me? I mean. Yep, you'll probably receive a phone call. And it looks like Adrian Williams and said she's having the same issue. So as long as y'all email it to me, I know how to find um, Todd and Brent and those folks. So. Okay. Um, I guess that I'm just looking forward to hearing from the money, hopefully. Sure. Okay. That's uh, 1230. I think that wraps it up. So a couple things. Uh, there were a lot of questions that we did not get to and Senator Sen has given her email address a few times and every time I call her I know she's responding to these so I know she's all over it so that's Sandy Sen S-A-N-D-Y-S-E-N-N -N, at sccenate.gov um, a couple things we are going to copy and paste all these questions and the chat rooms will save this and Senator will get that to you also we have recorded this we're going to put this on your website and your Facebook page so people can refer back to it so yes uh, contact Senator Sen if you didn't get your uh, question answered and thank you Todd from SC do we appreciate your time thanks SC do and to push digital thanks Wes of course all right guys thank you take care Bye, thank you